I'm not going to talk directly about climate change this evening, although it does come up a little bit, and I'm happy to talk about some more direct um, intersections in the Q&A. And what I am going to talk about is decidedly carnivorous. So if you are a vegan or a vegetarian, I offer that disclaimer in advance. Um, it simply comes with the territory of the particular history that I'm going to talk about. And that history starts, um, or I'm going to start it, in the spring of 2017, when a whale like this one um, on the, the screen here swam north around St. Lawrence Island, which is the little green dot um, in the middle of that map, right between what is now Russia and Alaska. And this whale was massive. She was almost 60 feet long and weighed 60 or 70 tons. And she might have been about two centuries old. And over that lifespan, this whale, whale helped make the Bering and the Chukchi and the Beaufort Seas, which are the bodies of water that surround the Bering Strait, more alive. By surfacing and by diving, bowhead whales like this one churn nutrients through the water column, bringing up iron and phosphorus um, and nitrogen from the seafloor and plume the fertilizer of their dung through the entire water column. And this goes on to feed phytoplankton, um, the, the algae and diatoms and other um, tiny photosynthetic organisms that are the productive beginning of every marine thing in the Bering Sea ecosystem. Those diatoms make their way into these giant schools of krill, um, which are tiny little crustaceans. And to give you a sense of how massive these kind of schools can become, um, you can see them with drones uh, from quite high up in the air. They turn the surface of the water pink. Those krill um, go on to feed schools of fish. Um, one of the richest marine fisheries in the world is in the Bering Sea. Um, and then in turn become the food of bowhead whales. The the krill do, the bowheads don't actually eat many fish. And the bowheads themselves um, are part of a kind of fully linked ecological process, even in their deaths, when they fall to the, um, the floor of the ocean in a phenomenon that ecologists call whale fall. Um, and there are whole species of invertebrates and probably also bacteria that specialize just in working in the um, the environment created in the oily bones um, and carcasses of whales. This is a still from um, a NOAA, a National Atmospheric or Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration um, submersible that found one of these whale falls in process. And if you ever want to hear some scientists just be absolutely gleefully nerdy about something, um, if you Google this whale fall video, they're very unusual to see. Um, and so this submersible happened to come across one. So you can get a sense that even after they die, um, these whales are critical to the functioning of the entire world around them. And part of what they do in that is they make the seas more abundant. When whales are absent, there is less, less life in the water. And part of that work of the whale for the last at least 2,000 years, but probably longer, is to make the oceans a place that can feed human beings. The distant ancestors of the indigenous peoples who live around the Bering Street today, the Yupik and the Nupiak, were able to make from whales permanent settlements close or above the Arctic Circle in places that have no trees um, and are not particularly hospitable to traditional agriculture. These are not places where amber waves of grain grow particularly easily. But so much food and fuel come from the body of a single bowhead um, that they fed entire villages all along the edges of the Bering Strait. So in this map, um, the, the routes of the whales um, are moving through the water, but you can see the little dots of villages um, that are placed in places where people could intersect their hunts. And this role of whales in feeding people in a very kind of direct bodily way is true in the 21st century. And it was true in 2017 when a young man named Chrysippus Ngok harpooned this bowhead whale in the seas off of St. Lawrence Island. At the time, Chris was 16 years old, and to make the first strike on a whale that would feed his family and feed dozens of others was a moment of great pride. The village of Gamble, where Chris lives, is allowed six strikes on bowhead whales by the International Whaling Commission, and each one of those strikes has meaning 
The food in the Gamble store, when I last visited it in 2019, is incredibly expensive. It can cost me 40 or $50 a day just to feed myself as an individual. So imagine trying to feed a family. And that entire kind of um, supply chain to get out to Gamble in the middle of the Bering Sea is extremely prone to disruptions from the weather, from inflation, uh, from COVID-19. So having your whole life depend on food that's flown in is extremely chancy. But beyond sustenance, killing a bowhead whale has deep and I think almost immeasurable cultural significance. To put the first strike on a whale is therefore a transformative moment in a young Yupik person's life. And so Chris did what any teenager might do in such a great moment. He posted the news on Facebook. And it's here that a man named Paul Watson found a passing Gox post. And Watson is a man who is willing to go very far for whales. In the 1970s, he put his body between Soviet factory ships and sperm whales off the California coast. In the 1980s, he snuck into Siberian waters in an attempt to document the way that the USSR used the bodies of gray whales to feed commercial fox farms and very, very narrowly evaded escape from the KGB. And if you travel in that part of Russia now, there are still stories about Paul Watson getting away from the, the, the KGB. And by the 2000s, he was starring in a reality television program called Whale Wars, where he would track uh, primarily Japanese and Icelandic factory whaling ships off the coast of Antarctica or around Iceland. But he was also, by 2017, a fairly controversial figure. He was one of the founding members of Greenpeace, but by then, Greenpeace's website formally disavowed him. But he's also very popular. He has thousands of followers, um, on all of the various social media platforms, which is maybe the one tie-in I have to AI in this whole lecture. Um, not even AI. Um, and many of them are celebrities, so his, his posts have a great deal of reach. And when Watson saw a passing gawk's post about hunting this bowhead, Watson took a passing gawk as just another whale killer and described him in his own Facebook post with a great deal of invective as a young man guilty of, quote, snuffing out the life of this unique, self-aware, intelligent, social, and sentient being, end quote. Within hours, Chris Apasengok was receiving death threats. And so social media de descended, as it tends to do, into an impasse. The avowed lovers of Wales took to their barricades and indigenous families to theirs. And I begin with this incident not because it's news, um, it happened many years ago now, but because the impasse between the kind of outsider environmentalism that Paul Watson came with and the indigenous practice of hunting Yupiks come out of a very particular history. And it is one that I think has a good deal to say, not about indigenous whaling, um, for that is really for indigenous whalers to say, not me, but about the assumptions of the economic ideologies that ruled the 20th century and the economic ideologies that shaped Paul Watson's response to Chris Passingok. And those ideologies are socialism and capitalism. And since we still live under one of those ideologies, this history also speaks to our present. And it's a history that I'm going to tell through three groups of whalers, one group of environmentalists, and through what we might interpret of what we can know about the whales themselves. And I'm going to be doing so relatively quickly, so please forgive the inevitable flattening of the deep historical, cultural, and animal particularity that is to come. Where I wish to start briefly is with the first group of whalers, with what is going to necessarily be the briefest sketch of the longest relationship between people and bowheads um, on Earth, which is held by the indigenous peoples around the Bering Strait, primarily by Yupik and Inupiaq communities in what is now Alaska and Northeastern Russia, who hunt and hunted bowheads into the deep past. And this is very plain on St. Lawrence Island, where this picture was taken, where the bones of whales 
um, in this case, their jawbones line the beach outside people's houses in sort of different stages of decay. Um, in past years, centuries, um, people used to make their homes out of bowhead jawbones um, and ribs, like this particular um, home from the coast on the Russian side of the Bering Strait in a village called Ivan. Um, here, there's kind of a, a subterranean area is dug out, and then people used the, the jawbones like you would wood in a place that had better timber than the, the Bering Strait does. And so it is not a metaphor to say that people lived inside the heads of whales. And what emerged out of the incredibly long and extraordinarily close relationship between Yupik and Anupiaq hunters, and out of this long history of living with and near and indeed because of whales and inside their mind homes, um, there are a few important things for the history that follows. The first is that no people on earth have more experience with bowheads um, than indigenous hunters. And from this experience, the bowheads, like many other whales and animals and beings, are part of a world that, as a Yupik man explained to me in Russia, is made of all sorts of persons. Some of them are whale, some are walrus, some of them are stones or waves or ice, but all of them are reciprocating constitutive parts of the social realm. Whales in particular were understood to have their own country and their own set of moral laws that people had to respect. And secondly, whales in this world are capable of what we in English might call judgment. If people are not good to each other, if they are cruel to their elders or mean to their children, if they treat their dogs badly, if they do not care for the environments around their homes, if they are not helpful, if they act with anger in particular, bowheads are capable of seeing that from their underwater country and will choose not to visit. And in the oral histories and in the present practice of Yupik communities, it's understood that whales take from this judgment the information they need to decide if they will choose to give themselves to hunters. Whale hunters describe how whales will swim alongside the boat um, opposite the harpooner, and often for very long periods of time, um, observing them seemingly from the water until they will choose to either dive and come up near the harpoon or to dive and flee into the sea ice. And understanding whales in this way turns their actions not just into what is often rendered in scientific discourse as behavior. In this case, whales die out of choice, and they do so to create space for people who meet the obligations of reciprocity. And out of this emerges an ethics in which it is not people alone who make the terms of correct or good behavior. To be a good and worthy person is to live up to the standards of beings who are not human. And it also means that whales have great value both when they're alive and when they are dead. Both of them are necessary. Now, I as a meager historian do not have the ability to go ask a bowhead the AI is not there yet, I'm sad to say, what the meaning of her dives are, if they have any. But I can say that for thousands of years, the bowhead experience of human beings was this. Out of the more than 20,000 bowhead whales living around the Bering Strait, a hundred or fewer died each year to sustain people. All of this changes when our second group of whalers comes on the scene. And that's in the year 1848, when bowheads start to be hunted by another kind of person. And these are commercial whalers shipping from New Bedford, Massachusetts, which is just down the road from where I live now in Rhode Island, um, who arrived in the Bering Strait essentially because they had killed their way through all of the whales that their kind of Moby Dick style tall ships could hunt that were closer to home. And you can imagine that they did not, you know, go easily that far north. Um, it requires going all the way south through the Atlantic and then up through the entire Pacific, past Hawaii. Um, so whatever drove them there was quite, uh, was quite desperate. 
1848, that brings them up to the Bering Strait. And the first ship to arrive there describes these kind of fields of fat whales, as they put it, yielding dozens of barrels, hundreds of barrels of oil each. Um, and the whales seem to have no fear of harpoons. Whales, as one logbook put it, that seem to offer themselves up to die and lead to images like this one, where you get a sense that the whales are just sort of frolicking um, in the ocean and you can sail up to them with ease. What this group of whalers did with the deaths of bowheads operated from a very different way of understanding value than of the Yupik hunters nearby. For one thing, the whalers ate very little whale meat and they certainly did not live in houses made out of bowhead bones. They had come all this way north because of the oil that whales contained in their bodies. In many ways, this is the first Arctic oil rush, um, long before petroleum was on the scene, when burning refined whale fat in the homes of middle class and upper class um, establishments all over the east coast of the United States was considered sort of the best lighting. Um, whale oil was requisitioned by the US government to um, light its lighthouses all along the coastlines. Um, and whale baleen, which is the kind of um, straining apparatus that bowheads have in their mouth to filter all that krill out of the Bering Sea, was also used and was incredibly prized because it's um, a kind of keratin-like substance that you can heat and bend and it will keep its shape. It was kind of a protoplastic and it was particularly useful for women's corsets. So if I had been, you know, a middle-class-ish woman living in Providence, Rhode Island in the 1840s, and I could afford it, I would have worn whalebone basically next to my skin. And the ways in which whalers were rewarded for coming home with whale oil and with whale baleen was as a percentage of the entire sale of whale products when they got back to port. So if they didn't fill the hold with these barrels of oil, and if they didn't get as much baleen as possible out of bowhead mouths, it was possible that they could earn a dollar or two, um, which even counting inflation was not very good wages, sometimes for 20 or 30 months spent at sea. And these are not very pleasant months. That's one thing you definitely get from whalers' logbooks. They're extraordinarily boring when they weren't incredibly dangerous. So whalers were incentivized to kill as many whales as they could as quickly as they could because that was the way you were paid and that was the way you could return home as soon as you had kind of a full ship of whale. But this pressure to kind of hunt whales at volume um, did not mean that these commercial whalers did not observe bowheads and other species as animals with kind of a distinct selfhood and even with intelligence. In their diaries and their logbooks, they describe the ways in which whale mothers protected their infants, um, sometimes reading all sorts of 19th century maternal politics um, into the, these actions. And many of them spoke of the pain that they saw in the eyes of the animals that they killed. And some use a kind of language that leads you to think that this kind of mass slaughter that they were required to conduct by the, the economic form that they operated under became a kind of moral wound, um, one that was difficult to express. And you can get a little bit of a sense um, from their logbook sometimes of the degree to which these whalers, even though their number one task every day was to kill as many as they could, um, of their kind of empathy with and personification of the whales. Um, the whale whose head is uh, going straight up in this image um, is a sperm whale, and that talk bubble, if I remember it correctly, I can't read it from here, says, not this time. That's one who got away. Um, the, the two whales who are kind of in parallel with each other, they said, we'll die like heroes. Um, and these little moments pop up all over these logbooks, which otherwise can just be lists of weathers and um, latitude and longitude and be quite dull. So you, you get a sense that these whalers um, were very moved sometimes by the work that they were doing. And even the whalers who did not seem particularly empathetic with the whales that they hunted, um, their job was still to observe the behavior of these animals incredibly closely. That's how you found the whales to hunt. And they observed that after 
two years, roughly, of contact with these market-based ships, the bowheads changed their behavior pretty dramatically. The whales, instead of frolicking near the ships like we saw in that first image, start pulling back into the edge of the sea ice. And in particular, if they heard the sound of the little kind of catcher boats that the whale ships would drop to actually do the harpooning, and they heard that sound of those boats hitting the water, they would make for the edge of the pack ice. And if you're in a Moby Dick style wooden ship, you don't really want to take it very close to the edge of the sea ice because you know, small changes in the currents or the winds mean that that ice can move. And in a very bad situation, it can crush your ship. So the captains don't want to come close um, to the edge and the whales start to sort of use the edge of the sea ice essentially as a defense. Um, and you can get a sense of that from this image um, where these whales are kind of in the sea ice taunting the, the commercial capitalist ships. And in fact, the bowheads become so canny of the commercial whaling vessels that for a number of years in the 1850s, the entire commercial fleet withdraws from the Bering Strait. They conclude that the whales have become, as they put it, too canny or too shy or too wild um, to be safely hunted. And one might from this, if you are being speculative, or if you're taking seriously the ways in which Yupik whalers understand bowheads, see the whales as rejecting the idea of dying for capitalists. At the very least, there is no indication in this period that these animals stopped letting themselves be hunted by Yupik and Inupiaq communities. Unfortunately for the bowheads, however, the whalers did eventually return, the commercial whalers. And they did learn how to avoid the sea ice um, and kind of work their ships more close into the pack. And this commercial fleet, sort of despite the intimacy of the labor of whale killing, had no formal way to recognize the value of a living bowhead. There was no space in the society from which they came for a whale to kind of inveigh on what people should do. And a whale was legible in the forms of value that set the clock of whalers' lives only when the whales were dead, when they were turned into oil or baleen, and the oil and baleen really only had value in quantity. And so, as the logbooks of these whalers attest, the primary sense of what a whale was, the sense that was rendered in ink and recorded over and over again for the insurers, for the investors, um, for the kind of publication record when they returned to port, was the accounting of its valued parts. Um, and this kind of whale image behind me comes from a stamp that many of the log book keepers would have where they had a different stamp for each species of whale. Um, and once they had killed one, they would pencil in the number of barrels of oil that that particular animal yielded. So quite literally reducing the living whale down to its component parts. And the result of this sort of social sense of value is that the commercial fleet killed bowhead whales until there were almost no whales left to kill. The result caused famine for Yupik and Inupiaq communities around the Bering Strait, and it caused probably the extinction of some of those hosts of animals that once thrived on the natural whale falls. And it very nearly caused the extinction of bowheads. And it's really not until every last possible commercial um, sort of product has been replaced by something else in the market when spring steel replaces baleen um, that the whale hunt finally stops um, in 1907. And at that point, there's a less than 3,000 uh, bowheads left around the Bering Strait. But unfortunately, again, the harrowing of whales had not finished. Within a few decades of this kind of period of capitalist whaling ending, a new kind of ideological hunter comes into the North Pacific. And this time, there were factory ships, which is a technology powered by fossil fuels, not by wind, and that is originally powered by the, or sort of pioneered by the Norwegians. And by the 1930s, if you ate margarine in Norway or Britain uh, or Denmark or Germany, chances are its fat came from whales. 
Um, few of these were bowheads. Most of them were every other possible species of whale that had once been too fast or too big uh, for those wooden ships to hunt. So fin whales and blue whales, uh, humpback whales, the remaining sperm whales in the deep sea, um, basically any species of whale uh, could be killed by these big factory fleets. And in the middle of the 1930s, the Soviet Union joins in um, on the kind of uh, factory style industrial whaling. And the Soviet Union did not kill whales in order to sell them. Um, they killed them in order to make them part of the Soviet production plan. And I am now going to condense months of work in what I think is the world's coldest archive into a very brief paragraph. The Soviet Union, as I expect everyone in this room knows, was a Marxist project. It was not motivated by creating market profit, um, but out of an attempt to make the communist utopia that Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels had described in the 19th century a lived political and social reality in the 20th. And well, Marx, if you've ever had to spend a lot of time in a Russian history program as I have, left a great deal of writing for one to read, he did not leave the Soviet project with a very clear sense of what that socialist future, let alone full-blown communism, was supposed to look like. He was an extraordinary diagnostician of the ills of capitalism and what needed to be rejected, particularly alienated labor conditions and the incredible immiseration and inequality of workers at the hands of capital. But what he did not give Lenin and later Stalin was a particularly clear diagnostic of how to know that socialism itself had arrived. How do you know if you're getting to utopia? But by the 1930s, Soviet planners and kind of ideological specialists did all agree that one of the things that came with real existing Marxism was expanding material plenty for people. And this led the Soviet Union to repeatedly emphasize expanding production. And this was measured in the plan. And the Soviet Union has plans for everything at every level, from year plans to five-year plans, um, most of which were originally set in Moscow. Um, so if you worked for a tractor factory or for a wheat farm or for an establishment that raised pigs or if you made shoes, you would get a target for how many pairs of shoes or tractors or bushels of wheat or sides of pork you were supposed to produce in a given year. It was not good to not meet that target. It was very good to meet the plan and it was even better to exceed it. And this meant that whales made an extraordinarily good part of the plan at first. The Soviet Union gets their uh, kind of first factory ship called the Aleut, puts it to sea in the North Pacific, and is suddenly able to kill all those species of whales that had been ignored by the capitalists or they simply couldn't get to them technologically and are able to not just meet the plan that Moscow sets every year, but wildly exceed it, which means that the people on these whaling ships could go home as heroes of socialist labor um, and could be kind of lauded, sometimes even, and actually quite frequently at the national level um, for being kind of expert contributors to the socialist cause. And in the years immediately following the Second World War, that contribution was actually um, really kind of calorically necessary to the Soviet Union. Their country had been so decimated by um, the, the kind of combined death toll of fighting with Nazi Germany um, and the enormous um, hit that industry and their farming sector took that there were literally not enough calories. So for a while, cans of whale meat um, were making their way all over the Soviet Union as kind of a basic foodstuff. Um, my grandmother-in-law was, uh, grew up in the Soviet Union and has some, she wasn't a fan, we'll put it that way, of these cans of whale meat. Um, so interestingly, even though the Soviet Union has no particular uh, desire to market its whaling products or to create or meet a kind of consumer demand, they end up kind of creating a similar emphasis on quantification. Um, and this shows up in the Soviet version of a whaling logbook too, which was extremely good 
at valuing dead whales um, in all sorts of different ways, measuring them in how many pounds of fertilizer you could make out of their bones or how much raw vitamin A you could extract from their livers, in addition to all the ways that meat could be canned and whale fat could be turned into consumer products that ranged from pesticides to lipsticks. And there's some amazing, if you want to go down a huge YouTube rabbit hole, Googling Soviet whale oil cosmetics advertisements. Well, really, it'll take up a chunk of your life and you'll never get it back. But much in the same way that those capitalist whaling logbooks left very little space for whalers' emotion, there's something similar happens in the Soviet logbooks. There's no official space for what it meant to actually go out and kill whales the world over, let alone to acknowledge whales as doing important work in the world. And as with those capitalist whalers, this was not for a lack of observation at the point of the harpoon. Soviet whalers saw the same attachments among whales as their capitalist counterparts had, and they saw whales learn to avoid their ships. They saw them school around their young. And the Soviet marine biologists who often traveled on these whaling fleets were actually very far ahead of their Western counterparts in terms of taking seriously the sociability of whales um, and crediting whale song um, and vocalizations with communication. One whaler would recall later that he was thankful that whales could not scream outside of the water as it would have made his work intolerable. And this kind of experience of whalers, which again shows up in their memoirs, kind of non-official documents, and the observation of the biologists did not mesh with state ideological goals. In those goals, in the plan, the more whales you killed, the greater the production, and the greater the production, the more valid the promises of incipient communist utopia. So the work of marine biologists, um, which started showing dropping whale numbers by the late 1950s, was tied up with string, stamped as classified, and dropped into an archive. And to me, this means that capitalist and communist whaling have two things in common. First, the whalers themselves did not operate in a world that let them act on any kind of relationship other than extraction. The values that they served were set by very distant people, by consumers in Rhode Island or by planners in Moscow. And I'm hardly the first historian to diagnose the problem of commodification or the separation between production and consumption. But in the ways that whaling operated, I see a denial of the labor and knowledge of whales and of whalers both. And the word for this might be dehumanized labor, except I think it's more than that. It's labor that has been stripped of any formal way of recognizing the actions, the emotions, or the judgments of beings that are not humans. And secondly, the extraction in both the capitalist and in the socialist cases fed dreams of endless growth. And these are dreams that at the most abstract level reject death, that reject paying attention to death, and that instead imagine human life as an endless line growing ever upward into the future. And that future is not bound by the cyclical pull of birth and dying, but instead imagines a kind of teleology of freedom, and a freedom primarily from the wants and whims and limits set by what we might call nature. And this logic of expanding consumption of the commercial whaler and of the Soviet factory ship is the logic of a slaughterhouse, one that conceals death from the people who take it into their homes to eat it or to wear it, and doing so sloths off moral harm on the proximate few, well, many of us, particularly the relatively wealthy, stay at a distance, indulging in the illusion that humans are not dependent on others. And so there was no real moral reckoning with the cost of destroying nearly all whales, not as commodities. They were no different from petroleum or the spring steel that replaced them. And the Soviet Union, while rejecting human exploitation and trying to kind of overcome the inequities of capitalism, kept the fundamental separation between human action and the non-human world. 
as the basis for trying to create that human equality. And in the 19th and 20th centuries, that slaughterhouse logic defined the relationships between the kind of world's whales um, in aggregate and human beings. Even as capitalist and socialist whalers wrote in their logbooks of the moral injuries of killing at such a scale. For the illusion of that kind of growth was fed by a sort of rapacious death that killed through entire oceans and robbed whales not just of their fellows, but also robbed the world's seas of the work that whales do. This made whaling like dozens of other economic activities that are based on death that is made invisible to the people who consume it. And the freedom that it offers is from witness and from responsibility. And this is where, having gone through all three kinds of whalers, we come back to Paul Watson. And Watson was an early member of Greenpeace, um, which was initially founded as an anti-nuclear organization, but turned to the oceans when Greenpeace activists learned that the United States and the Soviet Union both used the oil from sperm whales' skulls to lubricate intercontinental ballistic missiles. And so they kind of see human fate and whale fate as fundamentally linked. In 1950, uh, no, sorry, 75, they tracked um, with the help of the Department of Defense, rather ironically um, for a non-nuclear organization, a Soviet whaling ship off the coast of California. And by the 1970s, the Soviet commercial fleet was so desperate uh, for whales that they were hunting just outside of territorial waters regularly. And so Greenpeace was able to approach on um, these kind of little rubber rafts and shoot footage of the Soviet vessel harpooning a sperm whale. And Watson sat on the whale's back as it died. And his mission, like the other members of this particular team, was to expose death. The members of Greenpeace and Watson wanted to assert the living value of whales by making their deaths public and making them terrible, to make the entropy at the root of the Soviet harvesting program a very, very public fact. And it was a necessary function, you might argue, and I would agree, because by the time Greenpeace activists took to the sea to protest Soviet whaling, the Soviet Union was one of the very few commercial fleets still operating after a 20th century that had killed three million whales um, the world over, and turning such species into dead parts of a Soviet plan um, was pushing a wide number of species toward extinction. But Watson also wanted to stop the killing of all whales anywhere by anyone for any reason, which is what brings us back to St. Lawrence Island in the summer of 2017. And if I liked Paul Watson better, and if he wasn't in the business of harassing teenagers, I would here apologize because I'm about to make him stand in for an entire worldview, which is a relatively unfair thing to do to a single person. But it's a worldview that I think, even if it's, even if it's kind of environmental form, keeps a very hard line between humans and nature. The politics of Watson's attack on Chrysippus and Gok is the inverted politics of industrial production. If industry can only see whales as valuable when they're dead, the corrective is to only see them as valuable alive. And it's another argument for renouncing death, not the denial of entropy through endless and invisible consumption, but the denial that death is bound up with human life at all. It is a vision that retains a strict separation between people and the rest of the world. And it makes Watson an inheritor of practices of ignoring entropy, either by separating consumption from production or by imagining somehow that we're above consuming at all. Which is another way of imagining that human life exists in a state of exception from the rest of nature of agency that grants us great freedom. The freedom in this case to create our ethics alone out of the world. So finally my conclusion. I don't think there's an option of the kind of retreat that Paul Watson seeks 
of that pure withdrawal from consuming anything at all. All of us beings in this room, which is to say beings that don't photosynthesize, have to consume something. We are not those phytoplanktons. We don't create the raw stuff of life. We just rework what the world offers up first. There is, therefore, just the question of how to do that relationship well. And one way of reading the history of humans and whales over the last 2,000 years is as a history in which the whales themselves have intimated through their behavior and their actions what kind of relationship they will tolerate. If we take seriously the understanding of bowheads from the people who know them best, the hunters who have lived with them for longer than Christianity has existed, then the history speaks quite clearly. Whales did not consent to be killed for the market or for the plan. Nor did the market and the plan have space in their intensely human-focused ideals to imagine whales as capable of making judgments, despite the experience of the socialist and capitalist crews who killed them. Bowheads were not part of the political community in either world. Instead, those whalers killed for economic ideals that saw the trajectory of human history as independent from any being that was not human. And even as Paul uh, uh, Watson made people witness whale death, he did not argue that people cannot live without whales. The hierarchy of human exception remains. But to live in the Arctic is to understand the inevitability of death and to acknowledge fundamentally the frailty of human dependence on the wills of other beings. To rise on an Arctic morning and to walk out into the world is to understand that you may not walk back in your particular bodily form. We're not at the top of the food chain, even with a 30 6 rifle in good aim. To walk out in the morning is to recognize our personal dependence on the persons and wills of others and the decisions they make of you. Perhaps I will be their food and perhaps they will be mine. The importance of this idea of interdependence and obligation beyond the self and beyond the species might seem academic here in the 21st century when very few countries wail at an industrial pitch. But I don't think it is, and in ways that reverberate far beyond the northwest coasts of Alaska and the northeastern coasts of Russia. Where I live now in Rhode Island, even if I lived without ever touching animal flesh, something, somewhere, is still dying many somethings. And even now that no one wears lipstick that was made out of whale or eats whale margarine or is wearing a whalebone corset, the habits of consumption encouraged by the economy that we live in is still killing whales at a, pretty, at a pretty brisk clip from the North Atlantic right whales that are essentially going extinct in real time off of the coasts where I live to the gray whales who are in the fourth year of a mass death event in the Pacific to the schools of sperm whales that keep beaching on beaches the world over with bellies full of plastic that they can't digest. Indeed, the shipping traffic off of the port that I now call home has killed more whales than Chrysippus and Gok will in a lifetime. And there is no space for whales to judge us in the price of those goods that are delivered into the port of Providence. So I want to close by asking what happens when we open the scope of historical interpretation to the narratives told about the past and its arrival in our present in ways that include the knowledge of whales and of their intimates. One result is that the idea of independence from nature and endless growth appears as a myth, not a fact. Another is how clearly we can see that the economic form we live in now runs still on the logic of the slaughterhouse, carried by labor forced to reduce the world into tallies of profit. It is blind to the work of the whale and to the wills, emotions, and even ethical judgments of other living beings. Thank you. <laughs>